There are similarities and differences between these 503B pharmacies and, and the 503As. With respect to similarities, the 503As and the 503Bs are both prohibited from compounding products that are essentially copies of FDA-approved drugs for the reasons that we talked about. This was a sacrosanct issue for, for the Congress, and, and one understands why. Both are subject to FDA's rulemakings on drugs that present demonstrable difficulties for compounding. One would anticipate that the agency would actually identify potentially different sorts of drugs in the 503A and 503B spaces, but that's not necessarily the case. And both are subject to limitations on the use of bulk substances, including the requirements uh, that, that I talked about uh, with respect to kind of USP and national formulary monographs, registration of the bulk suppliers, valid certificates of analysis. Yes, sir. So if Genentech decided to get FDA approval on a vaccine and syringe, by definition, 503Bs could not produce a vaccine and syringe. That's right. They would be violating the federal law. But speaking of the APIs, let me use that as, as a touchstone to kind of talk about um, some of the differences between the 503As and the 503Bs. So as I mentioned, the, like the, the 503As, the 503Bs had limitations, or there are limits on the types of bulks they can use. In fact, the 503Bs are only supposed to use bulks that are authorized for use on a list that FDA puts out. So in this respect, the universe of APIs that the 503As can use versus the, the, those that 503Bs Bs can use is at least potentially dramatically very different. And in the case of the 503As, as I said, you know, the, those APIs needed to meet USP formularies or be an FDA approved drug. But the idea was you didn't need to seek the FDA's permission to use them. You just had to comply with the law. In this case, in order to use an API for an outsourcing pharmacy, that API is going to have to appear on a list that FDA publishes or it's going to have to appear on FDA's drug shortages list. The idea is even if um, there is an API that is, you know, um, used uh, in, in an FDA-approved drug that doesn't otherwise appear on, on this list, if it falls in shortage, um, the, the Congress is clearly saying we want, uh, you know, uh, these 503B outsourcing pharmacies to help fill the void, to compound drugs to be able to serve these patients um, in, in the case of a shortage of, of the commercially available product. As I said, the outsourcing facilities are not exempt from GMP requirements. Like a drug manufacturer, they have to register with FDA. 503As do not, they never have. Outsourcing facilities have to comply with specific labeling requirements, including disclosure statements that say the products are not FDA approved, they've been compounded. In other words, the idea here is to clarify for the physician and the consumer the kind of precise legal status of these products and the, if you will, the rigor to which they've been held um, under federal law. But as I say, since these outsourcing facilities are expected to comply with GMP, in that respect at least, they would be held to uh, uh, the same sort of standards with respect to at least manufacturing um, uh, competence that you would uh, expect a, um, a drug manufacturer to be held to uh, in terms of ensuring the sterility uh, of, of a sterile injectable product. Outsourcing facilities must pay user fees to FDA. So again, this is a concept that's very much like a drug manufacturer. Outsourcing facilities must report adverse events with respect to their products, very much like a drug manufacturer. As I said before, they need not be licensed pharmacies. They just have to ensure that the compounding is supervised by licensed pharmacists. And here's a very big difference. Unlike the 503As, the outsourcing facilities may or may not obtain prescriptions for identified patients. And that's actually the language as it appears in the statute, which is kind of a strange way to write it. And what this clearly allows for is office stock. This clearly allows an outsourcing facility to compound products that it can then give in this kind of wholesale distribution way to a, a physician. It is in the physician's office. We talked about our, our hypothetical dermatologist. When the, um, uh, the dermatologist uh, needs to apply the product, it, that dermatologist does not need to write a script and have it go back to the pharmacy to then be filled. It can take the product uh, right off uh, of, of the shelf and, and use it. This is a technical issue. Outsourcing facilities may compound drugs that are subject to a REMS. I don't know if you guys are familiar with what a REMS is. Essentially, these are post-marketing requirements that the agency attaches to, to certain products that are being particularly dangerous in certain instances. And so, you know, an example would be something like GHB, 
there's a concern about safety and, and diversion. Essentially, what this is saying is that so long as the pharmacy can uh, come up with kind of approximate or, or equally um, uh, uh, you know, effective controls, they can compound products that are subject to these REMS. And there's no limit on volume that the outsourcing facilities may sell interstate. And so again, this is very different than the 503As who are expected to be dealing on a local scale.